<laughs> All right. Thank you, Eileen, for pressing that record button. So welcome, everyone, to our office hour using psychiatric rehabilitation to support people to develop skills and resources to reach their goal. So I'm Daniela labate Cavelli. I'm the Director of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiatives at NIAPERS. I'm so excited that we are joined today by Dr. Marianne Farkas, who all of you, I hope, saw either live last week in our first sort of inaugural webinar for the Training Academy. And hopefully, if you weren't able to see it live, you watched the recording. So, Marianne, if you could just push, push us to the next slide uh, for the housekeeping. Okay. I'd appreciate All right. that. Wait a second. I'm, uh, I, I could. I mean, I would if I could. There. There you go. All right. So, as you just heard, today's office hour is being recorded. And we'll be posting the recording along with PowerPoint today from today on our website. Um, we're asking you to complete the evaluation form and you'll be receiving that form uh, tomorrow along with this, the link to the recording. So it's really important that you complete that evaluation form. We use that to track your CPRP hours. Um, and we also wanna get feedback from you about how our trainings and our training events um, are so that we can sort of make changes accordingly. So please do complete that evaluation and send it back to us. Keywords. So keywords are for the evaluation. If you're watching the recording, you don't need to put the keywords in the chat box. <laughs> it's only for the evaluation. It's really difficult for me to keep track of the chat box if 150 of you are putting keywords in at the same time. So I would appreciate it if you did not put the keywords in the chat box, but put them on a little piece of paper or on a notepad next to you so that you can keep them for the evaluation. Also, Today's webinar is um, intended to be interactive, right? We have this interactive office hour where you have access to Dr. Farkas. So we're gonna start off by answering some of the questions that were left over from last week's webinar. Um, certainly encourage you to use the chat box to type in any new questions that you have, any questions that you've got that you brought with you after you've looked through the webinar or talked to any of your coworkers or colleagues about what you saw in the webinar. Any questions that we do not answer today, we will be recording an answer. Um, how do we say this, Marianne? We'll be recording a short video that Marianne will answer all of your questions in, and we'll be posting that along with the recording from today. So rather than doing like a big FAQ document, Dr. Farkas is just gonna do a quick little Zoom recording and answer all your questions on Zoom. Um, and then we'll post that to the website as well. Do my best. All right. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. So, I, uh, Daniela, don't turn it over to me. Why is this on here? Oh, so, <laughs> so last was... week when we had our first webinar, one of the questions that we posted in the original uh, chat was, what's one thing that you really want to do better and are hoping to learn that learning more about psychiatric re rehabilitation will help you do? And one of the answers that I saw in the chat box that I thought framed the discussion for today really well was to create a plan that really fits exactly what they're working towards. So custom tailored for the person, just not an umbrella of services. And, and I thought that that sort of framed the discussion for psych rehab really well. And I wanted to sort of carry that forward for today's conversation. Well, that's a good, a good uh, reminder of what's really critical about psychiatric rehabilitation. I just didn't get it in the moment. <laughs> All good. <laughs> so I'm reminding you quickly about some of the things that we said. Psychiatric rehabilitation is an overall framework that helps you to engage people in uh, deciding if they're ready to consider a valued role and then to choose that valued role and to get and keep the valued role and all the techniques fall within those component parts of the overall framework. I remind you that this, did people get PDFs of these slides? Yes, so you have a PDF of this. These are the uh, specific areas that the techniques attempt to help people answer. So remember that the thrust of it is to help the person answer those questions, not to help us answer those questions. So the techniques help you the, help you to facilitate the person being able to answer the question, am I really willing and prepared 
to set a goal about some role I would like. And we'll talk more about that later. All right, so choosing, considering, choosing, getting, keeping, focus on a role goal, and then skills and supports, assessing skills and supports, <coughs> excuse me, and developing skills and supports. All right, so let's just get to it. By the way, the first keyword is blue. Don't put it in the chat box. Keep it on a piece of paper. It will come up in the evaluation component. Keyword blue. All right. So the questions that you all asked in, at the webinar are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, here on the slide. And um, let's see if we can start answering the first one. So someone wrote in that John, the guy that we that I gave you a scenario for, which by the way was an incomplete and bad example of psychiatric rehabilitation, just to be clear about it. But anyway, uh, John mentioned spending too much money on cigarettes and beer. Should these issues be addressed? And if so, how? I don't know if you remember the story of John who uh, really wanted a girlfriend. And so he thought that getting a job quickly would give him some money so he could take a girlfriend out. And that was basically the thrust of his interest in the whole thing. So I just wanted to frame this question in sort of the overall uh, story. John is really looking to solve his immediate problem. That's what, why he wants to get a job, because his immediate problem is that he doesn't have a girlfriend and he wants one, and he thinks that getting a job will solve that problem. So he's focused on solving this immediate problem rather than looking at what his future life should be. So we would begin with him by helping him to decide whether he was willing to set these immediate problems aside for a moment and look at a future-oriented goal that would help drive the whole process. And if we don't do that, we're going to be putting out fires with John over and over again, because every time he has another immediate problem, he will want to do something or rather related to the rehabilitation process to solve that immediate problem. But psych rehab is really about roles and people's view of what a meaningful life will look like in the future and getting there. So it helps people to start thinking about their aspirations and putting what's going on now in the context of that longer term goal so that they can keep that role uh, and achieve more success. So first of all, we ask him to see if he's willing to set these immediate problems aside. Once he starts thinking about that, um, he starts thinking about what's important to me. How does that shape the kind of role I want to have? Then the requirements of that kind of life will bring up the issues that help or get in the way of his success there. So let's say his real future goal, the thing that really is drawing him is not his, a work goal, which is his solution to his problem, but his real goal is to live in an apartment with a committed partner. And having that partner might help him to decide that being healthy is important so he could enjoy doing things with that person, living a long life, et cetera. And if that was the key for him, you would handle this issue about too much money on cigarettes and beer differently than if you would say, um, see it as a budget issue that would come up in terms of uh, a focus on keeping that apartment with his girlfriend. So what I'm saying here is the context is important to determining what you want to address, why you want to address it, and how you want to address it. That's a big, long story. The bottom line is we wouldn't react immediately to him just saying that he spends too much money on cigarettes and beer because how important the different parts of that sentence are depend on what that overall goal actually is and what he's actually trying to do. Once we know what that is and he knows what that is, 
then we can address this issue as being a budgeting problem, spending too much on things that don't help me achieve this life in an apartment with my committed partner, or a health problem. You know, the problem is the cigarettes and beer. Okay, so hopefully I didn't talk you to death. Uh, let me just try to say a little bit more about that. So with John, we want to help him figure out if he's willing to consider this role goal. You know, how dissatisfied is he? What Based on what we saw, we don't know. His dis expressed dissatisfaction is about his social life, not his working life. Does he see change as desirable? We know he wants a life with a girlfriend and money to also pay for things he wants. He wants something else besides his current life, so he sees change as desirable. Does he see it as possible? Does he see it as within the realm, rather, of possibility? Is it manageable? He comes up with different changes, like going to McDonald's, going to stop and shop, being a physical therapist. So he could see change as possible, but the truth is based on what we had, we don't really know. Does he see it as pos positive? Does he see life with a change likely better than what he's got right now? Some people experience change as possible, but not positive because their experience of being of moving from one situation to another is that it always falls apart. So change is possible, but not positive. For John, he hopes that this change will get him a girlfriend. So I talked in the webinar about different things John would have to know about himself to be able to focus on that um, long-term goal. And part of this willingness to consider it is figuring out, does he know stuff about this? Does he come to the question with something in his pocket? So with John, we know some things. Personal criteria is knowledge about what's important to him. But we don't know much more about his personal criteria for decisions about employment. And importantly, we don't know if he knows. So what does he know about the environment? He knows, we know he understands at least some of the hiring process in entry-level jobs. We don't know what, what he understands about how they're organized, what's required, who he has to deal with. We don't know if he understands the characteristics of those environments. And John seems to make impulsive decisions, so we don't know if he has experience with a structured way to make life decisions. We don't know how much he has to learn about how to make a considered choice. So truthfully, at this point in time, instead of trying to worry about what skills he has and doesn't have, we would be trying to engage him in exploring this question. Is he even ready to start thinking about setting a long-term goal as opposed to jumping from things to, from one thing to another? So I want to stop and say the keyword, the second keyword is green. Don't put it in the chat. The second key word is green. Keep it for the evaluation. All right. So what would we do and when would we do it relative to the cigarettes and um, beer? I hope I've explained to you that everything that John is telling us is telling us that this is not the moment for him to be setting an overall goal. And because we don't have that, we don't know the context for why this statement about not having the money or spending too much is important, or whether it is important in the moment. So we'd first engage him. Okay, so what does a life role goal or role goal look like? Remember I said that a goal is about helping somebody to stay and grow where they are or to go somewhere else. And the process teaches the person to identify what's important to them, what are the characteristics of the environment, any environment, and compares them in a structured way. And it names a role in a specific setting within six to 24 months. Why? Because maybe John can't change quickly. If he doesn't have the skills now to be, say, a physical therapist, that makes the goal unrealistic. 
if we move it to six to 24 months, it gives him some time to catch up, to learn some of the skills he needs to learn in order to be able to consider the kind of goals that he really wants. And it's the driver for the entire rest of the process. So for John, we said one of his goals was to intend to graduate from a physical therapy assistant program, because he said he was interested in physical therapy, at Regis College in 24 months. Very specific. Until you have that anchor, some of the other things cannot be answered. Here's another example. I intend to live with a roommate in my current apartment on the east side until June 2024. So stay and grow or go somewhere. It can be in either living, learning, working, or socializing domains. But until you have that goal, you don't have the driver for psych rehab. So Marianne, I just need to ask you a quick question that came up in the chat that's related to this discussion. Somebody asked, why can't he have three goals? Well, let me ask you, and of course, I can't see your faces, so I don't know what you're thinking. But um, when you're dealing with major changes in your life, how many major changes can you do at one time? I remember when I moved from Toronto to Boston, I went from working, I worked as an addictions counselor. Actually, I was a community youth street worker um, in the addictions field. And I moved to Boston to enter a PhD program. So I went from worker to student and I changed countries and I changed living environments. And it was awful. I mean, I did it, but it required an enormous amount of energy and it was very stressful. Most people can only make one major life change at a time, and that's why we focus on one thing at a time. And we use that thing to anchor all the other decisions. And once the person, is, we kind of keep them stable and maintaining whatever they're doing in the other environments while we focus on change in one environment. Does that help? So the second question from the original webinar was a person said, I'm also curious about the subjective concepts of percentages. So I'm assuming that this is about the assessment process. So I went back and I looked at the slide about the assessment process that I thought probably was the trigger for this. So functional assessment, skill assessment in psych rehab answers the question, can I do the critical skills that really make a difference to my being successful and satisfied there? Not every single skill in the world, just what is really critical for John, for example, uh, completing a, an assistant physical therapy program at Regis College. What's required what do I need to do to make the place a role and setting that I want to stay in? Because being successful isn't all there is. You also, I mean, what's required isn't all there is. You also have to take a look at what do I have to do? What skill do I need to bring to this goal so that I can be happy there? So it's more likely that I'm going to stay and not jump from one place to the other. So in John's case, the requirement was taking tests. Taking tests isn't a skill. It's an activity. So he had to take tests. Everybody had to take tests. But going back to Daniela's point about individualized planning, for John, the critical skill necessary for him to take a test was highlighting important words in all the test questions because he had a hard time focusing and staying on track and really um, getting what the question was asking. So John highlighting the important words in all test questions on the monthly quiz is the skill within the time allotted. So not just that he could highlight them, but he could highlight them for all the questions when uh, on this monthly quiz that he had every month to complete, and the second part of the skill that was important was within the time allotted. So somebody else might have a totally different definition of a critical skill that was important to them to take a test. 
you know, for someone else, it might be um, uh, the, the number of times per test that I do deep yoga breathing to stay calm while taking the test. That could be the critical skill for someone else. Okay, so number one, the skill is defined in terms of the goal, but also in terms of John and what he's struggling with. What does it mean, the percentage of times per month? It means that if he has a, um, a monthly quiz, actually the time per month doesn't make a lot of sense here. He has a monthly quiz. Maybe he has, let's pretend he's got three quizzes in one month and he highlights the important words in all test questions within the time allotted on one of those quizzes when you're assessing him. So that means he does it one time out of the three quizzes uh, that he's got, which is 30% of the time. So it isn't that it's subjective, it's that percentages of time made more sense to John than the number of times, but you can break it down into number of times. So his current level of functioning is zero. He can't do this at all. I mean, he hasn't done it on any quiz. So his current level of functioning is zero. His needed level of functioning is uh, at least nine times out of 10, which of course, if I gave the example three, my math isn't so good. So what 90% means there, it should probably be 75%, two times out of three. I mean, no one is perfect. So you want to have a needed level that helps John to meet the requirement, but doesn't ask him to be perfect. Um, in terms of the percentage of time per week that he does quiet yoga breathing, before speaking to another student, when he identifies himself as anxious, this is subjective because it's related to satisfaction, first of all. And it basically says that his skill is when he identifies himself as anxious, does he do quiet yoga breathing in the circumstance in which he's preparing to speak to another student? So there are a lot of qualifiers there, but these are the situations that are very important to John being satisfied as a student in this college program. That is that he wants to be able to speak to another student. In that circumstance, when he gets anxious, can he do quiet yoga breathing to calm himself down? So we don't know how many times he's gonna be speaking to another student every week. And we don't know how many times of those situations is he going to identify himself as anxious. And that's why the percentage of time per week makes more sense. But we still can do a log if we wanted to be concrete, we could still have him track how many times did he speak to another student when he identified himself as anxious and how many of those times did he do quiet yoga breathing. Anyway, this was a long story to say, yes, it is subjective, but there are ways of breaking it down to make it behavior and behavioral rather and observable. Erin, right, so there's a little bit of conversation in the chat around uh, goals and goals changing over time and sort of balancing um, the connection, whoops, the connection that we have with outcomes. So I just want to try to get and put all that together for us a little bit, if we can, because I think there are all of these questions and comments are kind of related to what you're presenting. So Okay. Of course, the first one is, how do you balance connection with outcomes? How much do you try to build connection? And how do you focus that on meeting goals? And then the other parts of the conversation that we have in the chat box are, you know, goals change over time and people can change their mind, right? So what do we do in that scenario? And then on top of that, there are num there's another... Um, note in the chat box about one life role goal, but there are a number of short-term goals that lead up to that overarching goal. So how do we put all that together? Oh my God. It would be helpful if I could see the chat at the same time um, uh, as I'm looking at the screen, which obviously I can't do. So so let's just say, what is a role goal? I want to be um a parent i want to live in my own house as a parent 
with my two kids. That's a role goal, right? Uh, I and want I just, to- Just to interrupt you, sorry. But it, so like in to like terms of pros or core or HCBS sort of New York language, right? We could say a meaningful life role. We could say a life role goal, but it's all the same, right? Yes. Yes, of course. We're not talking about something that takes five years or more to get to. If it takes five years or more to get to, that might be what we would call a recovery goal, but not a psychiatric rehabilitation goal. And I'll tell you why, because we know from research that it takes people on average two years to change a behavior. To really change a behavior takes two years. So if you set a goal in less for less than two years time, chances are they're not going to be able to change their behavior in order to reach the goal. They might still reach the goal because you're supporting the heck out of them, but they're not going to be able to absorb and learn enough skills to be able to change their behavior. If you make it longer than two years, then it becomes an aspiration. If I think about what do I want to do five years from now, it's more of a hope, an aspiration, something that is kind of uh, broader and more vague. And it's there in my mind, but it might be less motivational. So we've learned that six to 24 months seems to be for more, most people, the amount of time it uh, required to keep people motivated keep the goal concrete, but not make it so difficult to achieve uh, that you can't, that it isn't uh, reasonable or feasible to do it. So that's the time frame. Um, the immediate goals that people have usually are much smaller. They'd be at the level of what we would call an objective. So for John, maybe the immediate goal for him is to learn how to highlight the important words in his test questions um, so that he can take tests at school. That might be an immediate goal, or it might be um, learning yoga breathing before he even gets to these other levels of skill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the reason we're not focused on that right now in the skill assessment is that we're trying to build links in people's minds, also in their hearts, between what they really want, what it takes to get there. And then we come to, in the next piece, the interventions that are going to help them to do that. Once you're in interventions phase, you will have smaller chunks of these larger goals that you're trying to address. Does that make sense for that piece? Yeah. So I think we get hung up sometimes on like the language of goals, whereas it's really just the overarching that life role goal is what the the two-year goal is basically. And then the, the steps people need to take or make to get to that goal are really more objectives and not goals themselves. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. And we don't really think about it as steps until we know what skills does the person already have. Right. Because then maybe part of the step is harnessing the strengths they already have to get to that two-year goal. Right. Because it's not always about building or creating new, learning new skills. Sometimes it's about using the skills you already have or using the environment around you to support what you're doing. Exactly. And that's why we say skills and supports, right? You know, you can do almost anything if you support somebody up the wazoo, (laughs) right? So um, I can't think of an example at the moment because I don't have a lot of support today. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I mean, you're my support, Daniela. So I appreciate (laughs) that. This laptop is my support, but this laptop is screwing up today, so I don't consider it very supportive. The internet connection that we have is a support. The slides are a support. The chat box are a support. I couldn't use the skills I have if those supports weren't present. That's what I mean. So 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 let's just go to that other question that you asked about. Okay. People's goals changing, people changing their mind. 
the structured process that we're talking about, if I can get to it here, I'll go back. Remember that we said the goal setting process teaches people how to figure out what's important to me in making a choice. So we're not interested in the choice immediately. We're interested in helping people learn how to identify what's important to me. What are my values? What are the things I should be looking for that matter to me? And that's a big question. For many people, if you make a choice, if you think about the last job that you um, chose to get into, hopefully it's your current job, but the last job that you did, you may have come up with three, maybe three or four criteria. How much salary, what's the salary? The salary is important to me. Where is it? What's the location of the job? And what are my job duties? But we know that a really solid, satisfying role goal requires between eight to 10 criteria to make the goal. So if that goal is to stick, so to speak, you really have to expand that list of criteria instead of making a choice based on one or two important things. Okay, so we teach people how to do that. Then we teach them about the environment. So I've given this example before, so forgive me if you've heard me say this. When my daughter was young, we had to make a decision about sending her to public school or private school because of the neighborhood we live in. I didn't know zip. I mean, I knew Zippo about private schools. So I could have gone and visited these private schools, but I wouldn't know what I was looking at. I wouldn't have known what to look for. So I had to learn about the environmental characteristics that have and what their implications are before I could even start to think about what are the three options I want to choose from. So I learned what difference does it make in a school if you have a small school community versus a large school community. I thought a small school community would be a good thing. Then I talked to a bunch of parents and they told me, oh, no, you know, here's the sweet spot. If it's less than this, things get too intense because everybody knows everybody. And then when they have fights, they haven't got other people to go to if it's too small. And if it's too big, of course, they get lost. Well, having someone explain the implication of the characteristics helps you to become an informed chooser. So that's another section of the work. And the last is to have some kind of structured way, whether it's pros and cons, or we have a way of doing a decision-making process to put all this information together. Otherwise you get totally overwhelmed. Why am I telling you all this? Because when you've gone through that kind of intensive process where you've learned those things, you are making a choice not impulsively, not based on the first thing that you see that looks good, not on your most favorite criteria, but on a comprehensive set of important variables and research that you've done, and you are much less likely to change your mind about that, number one. So it's much less likely in a psych rehab program that when you've done all this, that people go, oh, like John did, if you remember, oh, I, I put in my application at McDonald's and stop and shop. And the next time he comes back and he says, well, you know, I don't really like fast food. Maybe I want to be a PT person. People say that because they don't understand what it takes to make a decision. I seem to be saying a lot in response to a little bit. <laughs> Is that Does that help, Daniela? Was there another piece of this that I've missed? Whoops. Nope. I sorry. I just pressed the wrong button on my screen. No, I think you got it. And then, um, yeah, I think we can move on to the next one. I think we're good. Okay. So the next one, whoops, is a uh, question was, are housing objectives appropriate for psych rehab plans? If so, how can helping clients find and maintain safe and stable housing be incorporated into service planning? 
Okay, I have a feeling that I don't quite understand the essence of this question. So let me, let me, oh, you have a, you're going to summarize for me. Well, I, I have this sort of sneaking Why suspicion. Why isn't it appropriate? That's the question. And I, I have the sneaking suspicion that we're all, we're just, we keep coming back to the life role goal, right? <laughs> and I think it's all sort of related. Well, my question is, are the uh, plans in New York, do they specifically say that it must be about work? No, that it can't no, be about housing? Okay, so that's not the question. No, and so as a matter of fact, we use the language living, learning, working, socializing. So great. we use that, right. yeah. So let me just say this. If I am trying to help somebody set a role goal for the next six to two years, six months to two years, I'm not going to be helping them to find safe and stable housing as the goal. I'm going to be helping them to explore what the living situation is and what living situation do they want. And it is probably the case that safe and stable housing is one piece of that. But there's where's the role? It might be living with a roommate in safe and stable housing. It might be living by myself. You know, some people like living by themselves and it's less stressful than living with a roommate, but some people um, might want to uh, live in a condo or live in a flat or live in, in downtown, live, you know, in or the country. Or be a homeowner even, right? Or like be a buy homeowner. their own home. Exactly. Develop financial assets to own their own home. There's a whole skill training program about that. So this piece about safe and stable housing tells, tells us a couple things. One is there's too much of an emphasis on just one piece of the overall goal here, the piece of which is a part of the setting. And the second is that this person must be feeling unsafe and instable if that is something that comes up for folks. So that means that what's important to them has to be explored more. You know, what is it that for this person represents safe and stable? Who do they want to, you know, what role do they want? Uh, where do they want it? And some of those aspects might come up when you're assessing the skills they need and the um, supports that they need in order for that housing to maintain itself. So just to summarize again, there's no problem with having a living situation goal for a psych rehab process. As long as you think about it as a role in the living environment that is specific and uh, has a up to two year timeline to it. If you find yourself talking just about a certain address, then there are steps that are missing. You know, John's goal is to live at number two Green Street. Well, I would want to review that to see, did John make that choice? Why did he choose that? What were the criteria and values that made him choose that? And what's the role, as Daniela said, of him being there? Okay. So. Marion, did you give us the second keyword? Uh we should probably do that. Can you getting, ask? Did because, people because get we're it? getting on in time. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, I, you did. I, Thank you, everybody in the chat box. For some reason, I must have missed it. Okay, sorry. Okay, oh. I got scared there for a minute. <laughs> my bad. I thought, my oh bad. my goodness. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go to, does psych rehab always have to be obviously systematized? Often we cover these bases but it isn't as systematized as this. Clients seem to resist overly structured and systematized approaches. There's so much in this, I could speak for three hours about it, but I, I reassure you, Danielle, I'm not gonna do that. 
So let's start from the beginning. Remember that I said the goal of psychiatric rehabilitation is for the person to be able to answer those questions. That's what the process is. Being able to teach the person how to answer questions like this. Why? Because this issue of life role goals within two years is going to come up over and over again in the future. And the more the person knows how to do the process, the more they are going to be the driver and not you. So that's what being systematized helps you to do. When you're not systematic, you know how to do something and you might be able to get there quickly, but the person is left in the dust. So you're doing a skill assessment. The person hasn't a clue what you're doing, why you're doing it, and where they actually are emotionally is still back at readiness to consider a goal. So being systematic allows us to stay in step with the person and allows the person to learn what to do so that they become the driver. Clients seem to resist an overly structured and systematic approach. In my experience, they do that when the relationship isn't strong. When the approach and the worksheets and the steps take the place of the relationship, people don't like it, right? So the, the aim of psychiatric rehabilitation, the process we're undergoing, is not to fill out the worksheet. That's not the process. The process is to, in the context of a relationship, go through a system of steps, and usually when you do that, people are much less resistant. All right, I'm going to go on. How would someone provide uh, ROPSR to a person with an active substance use issue that's interfering with their ability to engage? Well, I'm pulling from my days I was going to say my days on the street, but that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> uh, You cannot do psychiatric rehabilitation without active partnership. You can't do it. That's the difference between recovery-oriented PSR and what often gets called PSR. It's not about the techniques. It's about the relationship, engaging the person in a partnership so they can actively learn what has to happen for them to have a goal and get it. So when a person has active substance use, what would you normally do? You would make the statement with your behavior that I am here, I am available, I'm open, and when you want to be in touch with me, I'm ready to be in touch. So um, you may have heard this in a podcast uh, Mike Seibold, my colleague who uh, was giving an example in the podcast, and I both had, interestingly enough, very similar experiences. I had a client with whom for six months, I did nothing but go to his house, stand outside the door and talk to him through the door because he was uh, using substances and also had a, a lot of other active symptoms that were going on. But I did that. Two or three times a week, I went out, I knocked on the door, and I talked to him through the door. And it took six months, but he finally opened the door. He still didn't say anything to me. And we ended up slowly, slowly through the process, getting connected enough that he was willing to think about something other than the substance he was using in the moment. So what I'm saying is someone has an active substance use, you're usually in the readiness segment of the psych rehab process. And in order for someone to be willing to consider their future, they have to be engaged in an active relationship with you. So whether it's interfering with their ability to engage, you have to become more creative in how you do the engagement. How might staff increase their ability to offer skill building? Someone new to the field may not have a large toolbox of skills they can teach a person. 
Um, and I'm just trying to see where I am in time here. Hang on one second. At about 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. I don't know why this is, never mind. Okay. So, um, so first of all, how does one increase their ability to teach or model skills? Within the context of this particular project, someone who is new to the field, by the time this project is over, hopefully will have a trained expert trainer in their agency who is a supervisor, a supervisor who's expert in teaching staff the skills of psychiatric rehabilitation. I'm saying this component is part of the design of the project that you're enrolled in at this point. So that's one part of it. Someone who's new to the field might not have a large toolbox of skills they can teach, but hopefully they will have a supervisor who's learned how to teach new people how to do psych rehab. So that's one. The second is um, that uh, you increase your ability to teach and model skills by going through some kind of programming because some kind of teaching program because teaching someone a skill is itself a skill. It's not something that you just sort of know intuitively. There's a lot of intuitive teachers that are around. However, trying to uh, teach whatever the skills are that a person needs rather than from a particular box or of uh, ready-made skill lessons is something that requires learning. So I'm not sure what the person really wanted with how does one increase their ability to teach skills other than what I'm saying. Um, I know that Danielle and I were talking about the different kind of services in pros and that structured skill development and support is a billable service in pros. And the requirements for that structured skill development and support really reflect the psych rehab process. You know, they're developed through a process of teaching, practice, observation, and feedback. Uh, and it pretty well lays it out. So I don't know, Danielle, I don't know how to answer this question better without being in an interaction with the person who asked it to really understand what was the point that they were trying to ask about. Yeah, and I think what they're asking, how I read into it was how do you how do you help teach someone or how does someone learn how to teach someone skill building? Right. And what I'm saying is you learn to teach someone skill building by being in a teaching program that trains you to do skill building. Uh, <laughs> right. So like and to literally do that, like tell, show, do, right? Like this right. is the skill we're going to talk about. So we're going to learn today. These are the steps to the skill, demonstrating that skill to so with someone, having them practice the skill and then debriefing their, uh, their ability to practice that skill. Right. Right. That a fair, right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Which is exactly this what we do in SSDS, by the way, like right. literally. Yeah. But I don't know whether part of the question was what are the array of what's the array of skills that someone comes to the field being able to teach, independent of the methodology of skill building. You know, a lot of people can teach making a bed or doing laundry or cooking because these are concrete skills, first of all, that we learned by watching somebody else teach us when we were growing up, if we were lucky. And a lot of the kinds of skills that people need are much more uh, in the emotional skill arena, you know, like negotiating conflict or being able to respond positively to negative feedback. And um, all I can say about that is if that was part of the question, then learning this skill methodology that we teach in the training program that you're going to be involved in, if you are involved in this, uh, will teach you how to address that. You'll learn how to break down any activity 
into skill steps that you can then teach somebody, regardless of what it is. So those, uh, and by the way, the last keyword is red. Red is the last keyword. Don't put it in the chat. Daniela, I think we probably have a couple more minutes if anyone yeah. wants to ask more. Yes, or, and um, there was a question. There's actually a few more questions in the chat, but I'm going to go in order that they came in just so I don't play favorites here. <laughs> Uh, there's a question. Um, what happens when someone doesn't have the capacity to decide what goals they would like to work on? How can I help them without feeling like I'm making decisions for them? Okay. Well, I'm very pleased by that question because the person who's asking it clearly has the right idea. And they're committed to trying to help that person to become active. So I've done this process with people with TBI, you know, TBI, traumatic right. brain injury. I've done this process with people with who are living with two different conditions, one of which is um, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities. You can modify the process to meet the level of functioning of the person. And what we've learned basically in those experiences is the more you break down each of the steps that I've described to you in setting a goal, the easier it is for someone to be able to do it. So if you say to someone, uh, well, today we're going to talk about what's important to you in making a choice, and that person can't, can't engage at that level, then you know that it's too broad. So then you break it down into smaller and smaller bits. I worked once with a gentleman who was uh, nonverbal and pretty catatonic in the locked ward of a psych hospital and uh, was actually lying on the floor when I came. And after I spent time engaging him and, you know, uh, sort of meeting him where he was, I realized that we couldn't talk about what was important to him without him having some experience about what are things he likes and what are things he doesn't like. So we started at that level where I brought in different kinds of cloth, like uh, corduroy, sandpaper, uh, silk, and I rubbed it on his hand and I asked him to just tell me what was pleasurable and what wasn't pleasurable. And I started there on the road to helping him choose a role goal. I hope that helps. Anything else, Daniela? Uh, let's see. A short one. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, there's one about the percentages and I think that one you may have to go into some depth uh, in, a, in, the, in like a recording. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Just reading through these real quickly. We covered that one. Honestly, Why? I think, oops. Okay. Yes, the response was that did help. Thank you. Very good. All right. So whoever, yes, Gabrielle, so perfect. Can I just ask an open-ended question myself? And Please. you can tell me from the chat, which I can't see at the moment, folks, uh, what you think. Was this helpful? Was this session helpful to clarifying some of the things that you were left with at the end of that webinar? In which I felt like I was moving very fast. Yes, very much. Yes, yes, yes. Lots of yeses. Oh, yes. Oh, great. <laughs> and oh, good. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> then I'm happy. I'm happy. So um, why don't I just go to the ending slides then, Sounds Danielle? And, just... and then I'll bring us home. Oh, okay. okay. I, I, and just to remind you that I will do a Zoom follow up that will record yeah. for <laughs> questions that you may have asked in the chat and that we weren't able to get to within this time. And what will you do, Daniela? Announce it to people or how will they know? Yeah, we'll send out an email through the, the listserv. Okay, so we'll is this people. what you're doing to bring it home? So this is it, that's correct. So there was a, some questions in the chat box about the podcast and I sort of knew that you were gonna go there, folks. So I put this slide in for you. The podcast is live, it came online very late in the day, Monday afternoon, we had some technical 
glitches putting up the podcast, but it is live and it's available on our website. I know Marianne was just um, mentioning the podcast. There was an example that she brought in. It's a wonderful 20 minute listening. Um, it'll really sort of drive home some of the ideas that we talked about because you'll get some real life examples from folks that have done psych rehab. So you can go to our uh, training page on the website, on the right-hand side, there's a little podcast microphone icon and you can listen to the podcast. That way you can also click the link or copy paste the link from this slide uh, into your web browser and you'll find it that way. Um, people are asking about the PowerPoint for today and people are asking about the recording. Those will both be posted on our website either late tomorrow afternoon uh, actually, they'll probably be posted late tomorrow afternoon. Monday's a holiday, so we're not going to do it on Monday. But So we're going to try to get it out uh, tomorrow, and I'll be sending out that evaluation tomorrow as well. Okay. And then I think there's one more slide for the second webinar. Yes. So the second webinar is scheduled for March 15th. We have Lenora Reed Rose and Marie Gillum from CCSI, our partners at CCSI, and they're going to be presenting on working with diverse populations, paying attention to implicit bias, anti-racism and anti-oppressive practices and racialized trauma and how that intersects with the work that we do in psych rehab. So really exciting um, and informative uh, presentation that they've put together for you. I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Register great. whether you can come live or watch it so that you get the links um, sent to you. So please register for that. Okay. All right. So and I hope, uh, can I just say this? I hope at some point we all get to actually meet each other in person. Uh, I look forward to that time. And you can come up and tell me in person that you were on this webinar call and, and we can introduce each other that way. That's right. All right. So go ahead, Daniela, and we'll wrap it up. All right. Thanks, Marianne. And thanks to the almost 200 of you that joined us today. So we appreciate you being here and learning with us. And we hope to see you in the next few weeks for webinar two. Thanks, everyone.